I'm proud to call myself a St. Louisan, and I'm honored to be here. And I'm thrilled at NCPTT for having the foresight and the insight to have produced this groundbreaking conference in this city, which has such remarkable examples of mid-century modern. By the way, I recommend that you peek behind these thick curtains and have a look at what's going on outside versus what's going on inside in this building that we're in, and you'll see how critical these discussions are uh, at this point in time and how far we still have to go. It has been said that Mad Men, popular television series, has done more to promote an affair with mid-century modernism than anything we in the preservation community can do, and perhaps that's true. I find it fascinating that that's beginning to occur. I also find it uh, disconcerting because we have a tendency in this country to Disneyfy our own culture and our own heritage, and certainly that might be a step in that direction. It's also interesting, and what I wish to discuss is that while there's a confluence of interest taking place, we're also finding that the very standards that were written to protect us from mid-century modernism are now the standards that are supposed to uphold and embrace mid-century modernism. They don't. And also that in this time of discussion and critical analysis regarding sustainability, in particular sustainable preservation, in light of the fact that our traditional building heritage is of its own right very sustainable, it could be said that mid-century modern is exactly the opposite. It's really not sustainable by design and in many of its details. However, in developing this paper, uh, I found that there are nuanced uh, differences to uh, my initial impression. And so I'm, I'm right now uh, interested in delving in those sustainable attributes that are a part of our mid-century modern heritage. These are madmen as well. Uh, Minori Yamazaki there in the center, and the development of Pruitt Igo in a period that I remember very well, where we were doing urban renewal and clearing out large swaths. In fact, on the riverfront where the arch now stands was the largest cast iron district in the world, larger than Soho in New York City, and exquisite. Uh, the area where Pruitt Igo uh, resided uh, likewise had an abundance of gorgeous traditional buildings. This was opening day. Now, I show this for a number of reasons because mid-century modernism and modernism in general is not so much about form as it is about other democratic principles. In fact, we've seen a couple of examples of Paul Rudolph's uh, uh, center in Goshen, New York, uh, the county center. Um, one of the remarks that Michael Kimmelman had made in the New York Times does, was that part of the outcry against Rudolph's structure was not its, its what many of us would consider uh, gorgeous form or the fact that it doesn't fit well in, in the community, but that it was a representation of transparency in democracy and that a lot of our current leaders don't like the level of transparency that Rudolph's buildings promote. Here, democratic principles and changing the lives for the better for large swaths of urban poor in St. Louis. Prudago became a spectacular failure, and uh, I'm not going to dive into it now because it's a very long story, but that's a myth. There's a great, document, uh, a great documentary uh, film uh, called The Prudago Myth, and I would encourage you to look it up and to watch it, uh, because it talks about all of the things that never did get talked about, about why these buildings fail. But it had nothing to do with their architecture. Our modernist buildings are no strangers to architecture. In fact, interestingly uh, and unfortunately, Yamasaki also um, uh, designed 
the World Trade Center in New York City. Uh, Walter Gropius Bauhaus in Dessau uh, was bombed and uh, partially reconstructed in 1976 upon its listing as a World Heritage Site in 1996. It received another treatment, and I want to cap off this discussion talking about Bauhaus. But for the moment, let's just talk about some of the faces and some of the facets of the practitioners so prominent. And pay careful attention to their quotes and the, the disparate nature of their approach. Corbu, that a house is a machine, that, that this machine age issue uh, is intrinsic. Loose is only a very small part of architecture, belongs to art, the tomb and the monument, and that architecture should be devoid of ornamentation. Well, that plays heavily into how well these buildings last because leaders and conductor heads rainwater direction systems were considered part of ornamentation. Gropius is if your contribution has been vital, there will always be somebody to pick up where you left off. If we doubted that there was an interest in the lasting value of the architecture that these people were producing, then we just need carefully to listen to their words because he's concerned about legacy. Mies, as we've said and several times today, God is in the details, true enough, and we need to look at details. And finally, one of our favorites, Louis Kahn, that sunlight did not know what it was until it hit a wall, and arguably until it hit his wall, because he knew material. And we need to be as nuanced about our treatment of materials and understanding what was in the minds of the architects putting these things together. Then, of course, there's Richard Neufer, who taught here at Washington University. Most modernist churches look as, as if they've been designed by atheists. <laughs> and on that, I was so intrigued by that, I decided that a good way to approach this would be to grab a swath of buildings that we're familiar with in our own practice. And so I opted to study mid-century modern churches virtually all in St. Louis. And you'll see the, the, the nature of the form of these churches varies wide, widely. But the core values of, of the sites remain pretty much the same. Now, before I start, I want to tell you that there are three points, and these are reflected in the paper associated with this talk, that I think are critical to our approach to the preservation and longevity of mid-century modern buildings. That unnecessary removal and irreversible modification of character-defining historic fabric. And again, that's both the ethereal nature, the cultural nature, and the physical nature in the name of energy and short horizons and unproven gains need to be avoided. That we need to be careful not to diminish the value of our intangibles those that were the core of our preservation equation from the beginning. And that the inventive patient solutions to optimize performance, those, those original components of beauty, commodity, and utility, need to be incorporated into our approach with a belief in the future. We don't need to do everything right now. We don't need to believe that we know everything about what needs to be done. Because in fact, technology is still very many steps ahead of us. And technology has already proved to be advantageous and disadvantageous in our approach. So let's be careful about what we touch and how we touch it. When I am in a synagogue, I show uh, as an entree by Eric Mendelssohn uh, in 1950. Uh, this gorgeous site was actually transferred by the synagogue to the Center of Creative Arts in 1985 and has been the happy home of the center, COCA, since then. I say that because if we think that these buildings are not adaptable, they are. But if you look at the careful lines that Mendelssohn conceived, you'll begin to see the encroachment of HVAC equipment and other modern components of the demands that we place on our buildings that begin to uh, ruin or corrupt the original intent of the buildings. 
there are optimal ways and inventive ways that we're fully capable of doing. I love Bob's comments about the hydraulics saying over and over again, this is something that we've done. This is something that we know. We've done it 10,000 times before. That gives us a level of comfort. We've put equipment in proper places. We know how to do that. We've done it thousands of times. Let's continue to do it. Let's be careful about our interventions. We're fortunate to have with us today Andrew Ramis, who's written the book on Harris Armstrong, who's a prodigious fellow, an amazing architect in St. Louis. This is his Ethical Society Meeting House, 1964. The reflecting pool in front is actually the heat sink for an air conditioning system in 1964, which was just redeveloped uh, a year or so ago. And that pool continues to be used as the heat sink for the air conditioning system. So these are vital, sustainable, uh, geothermal type systems that were thought of and incorporated. Yes, the roof leaks. Now, here's a condition though, but, but, but here's a condition and it's already been brought up. And again, we already know it. Barometric pressure. Our ceiling buildings that were intended to be open and to have passive air flow within them, once we seal them up, we've contained a level of pressure inside that when that pressure changes outside is like blowing up a balloon or letting the air out of a balloon. We can actually vacuum in the rain if we care to in a building by not being careful about the barometric pressure differences inside our buildings and outside our buildings is something we can measure, and, and we know it quite well. It has been said, and I'm saying this off the record, by someone in the Ethical Society, that once the vents on the windows, which were inventive, uh, these little radial affairs that allowed uh, what we call um, the, the fine grain tuning of, uh, of sustainable elements, natural ventilation within the building, once there was an attempt to begin to seal off the building, it was said that you could burn a piece of toast in the staff cafeteria and immediately smell it in the auditorium at the podium. That's not good. Another view and the, both the exterior and the interior of extraordinary stained glass inside the building. We need to be careful about swapping out mullions and glass and adding and subtracting elements that are so critical in the name of energy. Because the gains, especially gains where mid-century modern materials have such a high environmental impact, and the replacement materials have them as well, that that margin of energy savings is somewhere there, universally small. We need to be careful about the reasons that we do things and the actual returns that we're getting. This is also by Harris Armstrong. Uh, quite different, uh, only four years apart, uh, St. Andrew Presbyterian. St. Andrew Presbyterian was profiled in the Globe Democrat, and uh, there were some wonderful things said about St. Andrews. St. Andrews has a vertical vegetative wall at the chancel. St. Andrews has multiple levels to allow for accessibility. St. Andrews has abundant daylighting. St. Andrews has an air conditioning system that was divided out between the offices and the sanctuary. All these things so important to a sustainable life for the building. And St. Andrews used materials uh, that by and large were very, very long standing. I will say this, that universally, the stewards of these sites love them. And when we get to the Priory, I think you'll be amazed at, at, at just how much the Benedictine monks have been continuously in love with Mr. Obata's masterpiece. The acoustics are perfect in these buildings. And uh, contrary to uh, popular belief, because of the great expression of structural systems, you might think that, uh, that there would be a lot of embedded mistakes uh, or a lot of potential problems. There aren't. In fact, structural systems never came up on the radar. Heating and cooling bills really didn't come up on the radar. Adaptability 
was tough. Most, most of the spaces, uh, and of course these are specifically designed to be uh, religious sites, uh, didn't lend themselves to a, a great deal of change, with the exception, uh, of course, of, of Mendelssohn's example. St. Clair of Assisi, and I point this out because uh, there's the black roof and the white roof. The, uh, the, the form of expression we'd heard earlier about the issues of black and white being a, a fundamental component of, uh, the, uh, of, of our mid-century modern heritage. And, and here it is, however, if we begin to look at the Secretary of, Inter of Interior Standards, especially the newest iteration that has to do with guidelines for sustainable preservation, we'll find that it's really biased to sustainable preservation for traditional buildings. So if we follow the lead that's offered by our own standards and apply it to these modernist buildings, we begin to corrupt the very principles of some of the more ethereal elements, some of the more nuanced elements of the buildings that we often overlook. It's not only about materials. This is Christ the King, Universal Congregational Church, uh, originally Independent Congregational Church. A fabulous roof system that plays out inside uh, in a wooden form, very Nordic uh, in, in, in essence. Um, I show this because it, it catches light so beautifully, it's so differentiated, um, but this building remains in terrific condition. Most of the roofs, uh, this one looks like monolithic concrete, it's not. Most of the roofs, though, uh, had coatings of sprayed plastic, as it was called at the time, um, but coatings that uh, were relatively easy to continue to maintain. And as long as we kept water out of the buildings, they tended to perform very well. Churches, as a whole, tend to be cared for, perhaps more than most other buildings. And so we find this to be abundantly true. But Mr. Obata, in my discussions with him this morning, was so bright-eyed when we were talking about uh, roofs because he said that the one thing in the technologies of building construction that applies so well to preservation is our roofing membranes. They've improved so dramatically uh, over the years and is so applicable to the conditions that we face. Finally, Immaculata, who have nothing but spectacular things to say about their building and the use of the building in terms of the amount of daylight, again, the acoustics, the usefulness of it for a variety of purposes. Um, I was amazed, frankly, at how little work each of these sites needed. Here at Kirkwood United Methodist, there's a campaign on board to change the interior. Uh, there's a lot of dissent that's taking place uh, as it should and healthy discussion by a congregation that's deeply involved uh, in the care and longevity and understanding of, of their own uh, church structure. It's a beautiful structure. All of these are very welcoming to each of you if you care to attend services there. And finally, I had the most endearing conversation. So I had discussions with each of the facilities managers, stewards of these buildings, and went down a list that was consistent throughout. Uh, but this one I enjoyed the most. And um, clearly, there's a great deal of care. Um, but as was mentioned earlier, here is a building that has a radiant floor system that has cow wall when it was first introduced and it lasted nearly 50 years, which is uh, about a four inch thick fiberglass composite uh, wall system, black on the exterior and white on the interior, uh, translucent, sort of magical uh, in the sense, and you saw the slides er earlier this morning, makes the best use of convective currents, has beautiful acoustics. Uh, the roof, uh, uh, Mr. Obata was talking about the difficulties in, um, in, in building thin shell concrete uh, uh, formwork because of labor costs now, but uh, these roofs were recently analyzed and there wasn't uh, an errant fracture involved in any of the roof forms at all, which we would find remarkable in any of our buildings. But our traditional buildings have pathologies uh, that are rampant uh, relative to structural deterioration, right? Insects, water, um, uh, eccentric loading, and, and so forth. There are a lot of pluses that we need not overlook. The Bauhaus I want to mention uh, very quickly because this brings to mind 
the issue of my grandfather's axe that I inherited. Now, my grandfather had already changed the handle, and when I got it, I changed the head. So the question is, is it any longer my grandfather's axe? And I think that's an apt uh, relationship to have with the changes that have taken place at Bauhaus. Uh, Bauhaus went through a transformation in 1976, uh, regaining itself from the fire, a single glaze, and certainly that was the weak link in terms of energy performance. I was intrigued to find that there was a thermally broken, very narrow sight line steel window composite system that was developed in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands uh, that was incorporated here. But at the end of the day, the original Bauhaus window elements were transported away and replaced with a thermally broken steel frame window that looks a lot like the original. We had this discussion regarding the lever house. Obviously, the windows are an exceptional feature in this building, and I leave it to you to consider the importance of swapping these things out so quickly, and it's so quickly that concerns me. The Department of Energy has an increasingly stringent level of, of uh, codes and regulations that we are to follow, and I'm wondering who will be the leader in what is a possible conflict between the Department of Interior, Secretary of Interior Standards, and the teeth that are given to us to be able to develop solutions that make sense according to the stringency of the new international codes, particularly this one, the International Energy Conservation Code. Because historic buildings were exempt from ASHRAE and IECC standards up until recently, there was a discussion that maybe we were missing a huge market of energy savings. And so a task force was assembled that, in short, led to these conclusions that although many jurisdictions still apply, we missed an opportunity for energy savings by not including historic buildings. So everyone freaked out. Well, how can our historic buildings meet the energy codes without having to make major changes? And Here's the important clause for that. That the case of commercial and residential IECC application now requires the submission of a report detailing why any code provision would be detrimental to the historic character of a building. And that's what's critical for us. Because we need to be able to use the standard to do the right thing. We've seen a lot of frankly goofy solutions uh, the one on the left, uh, what we, Jill, my partner, Jill Godhelf and I, refer to as EcoBling. Uh, this doesn't work, and we know it doesn't work, and, and to turn it into a cross uh, is even perhaps less uh, forgiving, but I'm, I'm sure they had great intentions. Uh, on the other side uh, is, is actually, I think, an enchanting uh, 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 vision of an addition made to a building that refused to be added to. Now, in each case, uh, reversibility is key. And again, that's something that we know how to do. Did I just step on this? No, no, you've lost sound. Though. That's OK. You can still hear me. OK. So I'm, I'm just going to briefly say that, especially when it comes to window walls, because that seems to be the Achilles heel in our minds for mid-century modern versus energy code. We still have options. We still have laminated glass. Doesn't produce nearly the, uh, the uh, uh, U value that insulated glass does, but it does allow us to preserve the original machine-made extrusions that are in a, that, uh, a part of the original building. We, there are abundant dry gasket systems that can be fabricated for virtually any building that we encounter, and many if not most, gasketed window systems are made to be replaced because the lifetime for most mid-century modern buildings is 25 to 30 years. So the intention was to need to replace them anyway. The, the desiccant wheel uh, system down below, a big gizmo I'm happy to speak with you about, but managing moisture in a building is critical. Uh, we've seen some egregious moisture-related uh, slides here. But I can tell you, and Gropius knew this too, with radiators along the windows, even at the Bauhaus, that if we can control the dew point, 
On the interior face of window glass, we can control condensation. And it is not that difficult to do. Museums do it every day. We've done it for uh, Nelson Rockefeller's uh, 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 gallery. Uh, and then blower door testing, which allows us to understand better the differences in barometric pressure between the interior and the exteriors of buildings. I'm not going to read through these. They're a part of the paper, but I invite you to read them. These are 13 points that Jill and I have put together that we feel are the most critical challenges facing us. Uh, and it's more than energy that, it's that is at risk. It's our own cultural heritage. And I'll leave you with the last word. We write a column uh, entitled The Sacred and the Mundane. Uh, in this, uh, this, the current issue of Faith and Form, which is where it's published, is, um, is, our, is our most recent column entitled Modernisms. It's supposed to be golden egg. Uh, but in any case, that gold egg is the millennial generation, which in a recent study, interestingly to the world of religious uh, organizations, cited that millennials were very interested in modernist buildings because it allowed them a sense of traditionalism along with the sense of familiarity. And insofar as it related to the modernist churches that I had been looking at, which the monks embraced dramatically at the, the Priory and Abbey, as did every other congregation I spoke with. Uh, the idea that religious structures need to be deeply steeped in traditional buildings uh, sort of flies in the face of, of what we're finding uh, in canvassing the current population that's going to be become the stewards of, um, of this range of buildings. So again, together, we know what to do with our historic traditional heritage buildings. We know what to do with our modernist buildings. Practice these two things, either help or do no harm. Thank you. <laughs>